So it's a pleasure to welcome you to another in our series of lectures within the Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. My name is John Halden. I'm the director of the center. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce um, our speaker today, uh, who is going to talk on the subject of Britain and the British question. Ali Ansari is Professor of uh, Iranian History at the University of St. Andrews in Great Britain. He's also Founding Director of the Institute for Iranian Studies at St. Andrews. And he's a Senior Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and the President of the British Institute of Persian Studies. So he's relatively well qualified <laughs> to speak to us today. Broadly speaking, his research is centered on questions of the development of the Iranian nation uh, in terms of uh, nation state, myth building, uh, social and intellectual history, and Iran and the West. And he's published a number of very important books. I won't quote them all, but three which are particularly important are The Politics of Nationalism in uh, Contemporary Iran, published in 2012, um, Crisis of Authority, uh, a book about the elections of 2009, and then a book on Iran under Ahmadinejad, published in 2008. And he's also the editor, I see at the bottom of my notes, of The Cambridge History of Iran, Volume 8 on the Islamic Republic. So, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ansari. He'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A if we, if we want. I'm sure you're happy to take questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, and we should round up by about 6 p.m. So, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Reagan, Rose, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a humbling uh, experience to come here and visit your great centres and institutes when. Uh, compared to the, the funding regime that we have in Britain, where I count myself as among the successful fundraisers, but I have to say it's, uh, it, it, everything is relative. Um, <clears throat> the work that I've been doing of late really is about, uh, has been about nationalism in Iran and the formation and the development of nationalism and state building in Iran. And one of the aspects that's been of great interest to me has been the way in which Iranian intellectuals have engaged with uh, Western intellectuals. Now, for a long time, and I'm very pleased to see Professor Ashraf here. Uh, for a long time, you know, the, 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 the argument had been really that um, uh, Iranian nationalists, certainly the sort of the earlier nationalists of the late 19th and 20th century, either simply went and emulated Western ideas or they borrowed them in a very sort of uh, ham-fisted way, one-dimensional way, and didn't really engage with these ideas. And it's really the work of uh, people like Professor Ashraf and others that have basically brought to our attention the fact that this level of engagement uh, this dialogue, in a genuine sense, between Iranian intellectuals and their Western interlocutors was, was a good deal more, more seri serious and nuanced than we like to think. Um, unfortunately, I should say, because of the Islamic Revolution, we've tended to sort of view uh, the history of Iran through the prism of 1979 and, because of the, uh, and of the intellectuals that led to that period. But I've been more interested, really, in the earlier period in those, those thinkers that have shaped... Uh, the very uh, notion of the of, of, of the nation and nationalism uh, from the late 19th century to the and, and the early 20th century. That period, which I've sort of argued or defined as a sort of the main constitutionalist period. Now, central to this, of course, has been the role of Iran and Iranian intellectuals in the West, and of course, uh, Britain looms large. And as you'll see from this first slide, uh, the fact of Britain's perfidious involvement in Iran is one that is very current. Um, this is a poster, in actual fact, from a conference that was held in Iran, I think, about two years ago, just to remind ourselves about how awful British influence had been uh, uh, in the country and how, uh, how, uh, how disruptive it had been. It always baffled me, of course, that when you look at the history of Iran in the 19th century and you compare the Russian and British influence, uh, that the Russians often got off very lightly. I never understood why the Russians... Uh, for that period, never actually got the same sort of opprobrium as the British. Um, and there are various reasons for that, which we may go into, I suppose, in, 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 in questions, or I might allude to, certainly, in, in some of the talk. But it certainly seemed to be, to me, uh, somewhat un unbalanced. And it also seemed a bit unbalanced because the length of the relationship uh, between Iran uh, and, uh, and Britain and the British Empire, but also the nature of the relationship always seemed to be a good deal more nuanced. Just in terms of context, in terms of the British relationship with Iran, of course, Britain approaches Iran through India. And this is a major, major determining factor. Partly because, of course, with India and British India, or the, 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 the Raj as it develops in the 19th century, is really part of what we might call the broader Persianate world. So what you find is Britons that move 
uh, and work in Iran or, or as, as diplomats and, 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 and soldiers and others are coming from uh, a, a, a cultural orbit of the Persian world and therefore they're familiar with aspects of Persian culture. This gives them a certain advantage in terms of their engagement um, in a way that perhaps the Russians uh, did not. But it also means that because Britain was present, obviously, in India uh, for the better part of 200 years at least, uh, you have an engagement. You know, Britain, in that sense, becomes uh, a neighbor, uh, a geographic neighbor in some ways to Iran. But also, Iran plays a very pivotal role in terms of, of British policy towards Russia and obviously what we get to know as the great game. But throughout the 19th century, um, this developing role is one that is not wholly negative. It's one that it's, uh, is certainly uh, of, of, of long duration. The gentleman on your left is the first uh, Persian ambassador to the court of St. James, Abul Hassan Khan, who went there in 1810. Um, and this sort of at least suggests that the level of sort of uh, diplomatic relations with, with Britain are at least 200 years old, if not longer than that in some ways, if you count, obviously, if you go further back with the Shirleys and others. But, I mean, this is the first sort of systematic period. And it's also the period during the Napoleonic Wars uh, when you get a first series of British Orientalists moving into Iran, um, engaging both diplomatically but also in a cultural and, 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 and intellectual way. And their assessments of Iran in this period are quite interesting. Um, they look at Iran, in particular people like Sir John Malcolm, uh, someone who I'm particularly interested in because he's, at least his family in origins were from Fife, which helps, although they weren't in his day. But as a Scot, he was also the first person to write a, a, a history of Persia in the English language. Um, but his insights uh, into, along with his other compatriots, into why Iran uh, did, had not achieved its potential during the period of Fat Ali Shah and uh, the, the early Rajah period are quite interesting. Uh, and the reason why uh, they're important in some ways is because they were taken up by a number of British, uh, make part of a number of Iranian intellectuals later. So Malcolm, when he's looking at, uh, at Iran in this period, fundamentally basically argues, you know, he argues one central role, and that is that the problem of Iran is not its people, the problem of Iran is its politics. And this is a very important distinction. And the distinction for this is basically to say that if you can get the politics right, if you can get the nature of its government right, then its people could achieve its potential. And many of the ideas that Malcolm is arguing, as well as others who are there, are basically ideas that we would derive from, uh, that we would understand to be Enlightenment ideas, 18th century Enlightenment ideas, drawn from, as you'll see, what I argue is essentially a Whig conception of progress. And their argument is, is basically that through the proper development of the state, through proper rules, regulations, laws, the rule of law, and above all, the use and application of education, you can develop uh, your politics and society in a way that would be productive. And interestingly, when they engage, Malcolm has a wonderful book, by the way, which I would recommend that you have a look at if you haven't, called Sketches of Persia. And interestingly, his, this is sort of his memoirs, but in, in a classic sense, he talks about, it talks about himself in the third person, which is rather curious. But nonetheless, uh, this was a challenge, actually. The reason this book was written, this memoir was written, was partly to challenge uh, uh, another fictional account that was being was very popular at the time in, in, in Britain, and that was James Moria's Haji Baba of Isfahan, of course, which gained a huge amount of popularity in literary circles, but unfortunately became viewed by a number of people as fact rather than satire. Uh, Malcolm, among others, decided to publish his own memoirs and his account. And in this Sketches of Persia, he gives the Iranians themselves a voice. It's one of the first books I find where you have a traveler going there, not simply observing the country, but actually allowing uh, the Iranians at the time to sort of speak about you know, their own understanding of the way in which their politics and society works. And one of the most engaging things he does is basically talk to Fat Ali Shah, and Fat Ali Shah asks him about the nature of monarchy in Britain. And uh, uh, when Malcolm comes back, he says, you know, this is, you know, King George has the following powers, and these are his limitations, and so on and so forth. Fat Ali Shah says, well, you know, it sounds to me as if your king is nothing more than the first magistrate of the country. He said, it's, uh, that's probably will provide a lot of stability, but it's quite boring. He said, at least my monarchy is a lot more fun than yours. But when I die, my sons will fight over my inheritance. There will be chaos and anarchy. But, you know, at the end of the day, then we'll find a real sort of soldier to come and take over the state. And basically what Malcolm 
is using this sort of anecdote to show is that one of the real uh, problems of the Iranian state is the lack of stability. The lack of stability, the constant sort of turnover in sort of politics, that inability to build anything of, of, of long duration. And he says, basically, as he moves forward, he says, you know, if you, you know, if you adopted the ways that, that we have, in a sense, adopted, uh, you too could be as successful as us. And the, the British accounts are very clear on this. And when they're talking, when they're trying to impress the Iranian uh, interlocutors uh, and Iranian visitors, as I'll outline in a minute, to, um, uh, uh, to Britain, they sort of say, you know, if you look at us 200 years ago, we were nothing better than savages. You know, we used to do things like kill our king, for instance. But now, you know, we're one day talking obviously about the Civil War. But, you know, they sort of say now because we've adopted discipline, order, the rule of law, we have been able to achieve various things. And the implication of the, all this, of course, is that progress is not something that is intrinsically Western or Eastern or whatever. It's something that belongs to a sort uh, what we might term an Enlightenment project. The globe, for those of you who are familiar with this, is a, situated in the central bank vault. But again, just to give you an idea of just how the relationship had been built over this period, those of you who are familiar will see this is a, an amazing, uh, an extraordinary uh, item of, uh, I was going to say jewellery, but it's a bit more than jewellery, I think. Um, the emeralds make up the seas, uh, rubies make up the land, and there are two states that are in diamonds. One is Britain and the other is Iran, and it's meant to indicate internal friendship. I say any of these things because, you know, obviously our, our view of, of British relations with Iran are so coloured by events in the 20th century. I just want you to get an impression or understand that in, the, in a contextual way, in the 19th century, Britain, more often than not, was seen as a potential political uh, ally. And here, uh, I was just like, I just threw this picture in because I find this also quite interesting and it allows us to revisit it. It's a sort of an entree slide, this really. This is Zarif, actually, this summer before he was, uh, uh, I think, heading off to do something. I thought I might get the word nuclear in once, at least in this lecture. So this is while he's defending, obviously, the new nuclear accord. But what struck me and what struck a number of readers was the book he was holding. And I don't know if you, those of you can see it. The book he's actually holding and someone had given him is the memoirs of Zokol Molk, Mohammad Ali Fourouri, and his memoirs of the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. Now, the reason why I found that intriguing is because Fourouri is not really a popular person in the pantheon of, uh, how should we say, uh, post-revolutionary intellectuals. He's seen very much uh, as an Anglophile, an Anglophile who did all sorts of things that were basically uh, wrong in terms of the secularization of the state, nation building, so on and so forth. And yet here you have the current foreign minister of Iran uh, rather uh, indulgently, in a sense, uh, broadcasting the fact that he's reading this chap's memoirs in the, in the, in the Iranian parliament. And it does allow us to think that, you know, has Fourouri suddenly come back in? Is Fourouri someone now who is more acceptable? And I certainly hope he is, because Fourouri, for me, uh, is emblematic of this, uh, of, um, uh, of, 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 of the sort of the relationship between Britain and Iran uh, uh, in, its, in, its, in its more positive um, connotation. And this is him again. Now, the critical thing here, and what I want to be clear uh, with everyone is to understand that there is a distinction. Most people, when they look at British relations with Iran, think in terms of the politics of that relationship. And the politics of that relationship can often be quite murky. Although, as you'll see in a minute, uh, it's a good deal more nuanced. But certainly, when we look, obviously, uh, the 1919 agreement or uh, the 1951 nationalization of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. And what I want to do is sort of help us distinguish between what we might call a political engagement, which was often quite difficult, and an intellectual engagement, which was often much more positive. And it's these things that are different. That basically, whereas someone like Fourouri might argue emphatically against the politics of Great Britain, let me correct myself there, against the policies of Great Britain, what they did adopt, however, or what they did try and absorb, were the politics of Great Britain. So these are quite distinct sort of modes. The policies they always found fell short of the politics. And this is quite interesting. So um, Edward Eastwick, a diplomat who uh, served in Iran in the 1860s, has a wonderful account in his diary where he meets a Rajah prince in Khorasan. And the Rajah prince is talking about the defense of the border. And he says, the trouble with you Brits is you won't let us take Herat. And because you won't let us take Herat, we can't protect our border. And we can't protect our border against these Turkmens. 
And these Turkmen raid across the border into Iran and they take lots of our Persian compatriots as slaves back up uh, to Central Asia. And he says, I don't understand how you, and he's talking to Edward Eastwick as a diplomat, who profess and brag and boast about the abolition of the slave trade and that you are defending something in favor of humanity, can tolerate the fact that Turkmen raid this country and take away Persians as slaves. And Eastwick, interestingly enough, I mean, it's a wonderful account, it's a wonderful, uh, I suppose, example, early example of what Iranians would consider the hypocrisy of British policy, which was basically that you stand up for various ideals, ideals that we can subscribe to and ideals that we like, but you don't seem to apply them very, very, very universally. And the interesting thing, of course, is, though, is that Eastwick himself acknowledges that in his memoirs. He sort of says, you know, I thought the prince had a, had a point, you know, that what we were doing was not exactly right up there. You know, we weren't applying our, our ethics in quite the way we should. But what's interesting about that comment is that the prince himself, the Rajal prince at the time, acknowledged that he sort of says, you know, this is something that we see in you that's quite positive. But why won't you give us the benefit of what you're doing elsewhere? Why do you protect, you know, the African races, as he says, but you won't help us? We who are your friend. So that political engagement and intellectual engagement are quite, are quite distinct. And until we can make that distinction, I think you won't, we don't understand really how far these sort of British political ideas or Whig political ideas, in a sense, uh, become so prominent in, uh, uh, in, in Iranian intellectual thought in this period. And what I don't want to say is basically, I'm not going to uh, say to you that um, there are clear intellectual lines, or certainly I haven't found them yet, where you can see British thinkers permeating uh, a, a direct inheritance into uh, aspects of intellectual thought uh, among Iranians. But what you do see is a great fascination with Britain, per se, as a model of political and economic development. So when, for instance, a number of uh, Iranian travelers go, visitors, often very highbrow visitors, go to Britain in the, in the 19th century, and I'm not just talking about Nasruddin Shah, by the way, but a number of the others do, what, do, what are they impressed about in their accounts? What do, they, what do they talk about? They talk about industry. They talk about education. Above all, they talk about things like the press. They occasionally talk about the Navy, but they're not overly militaristic in their approach. What they're interested in is in politics. And they know the politics reasonably well, actually. Or they certainly have accounts of the politics reasonably well. They talk about the House of Commons. They talk about the House of Lords. They talk about the monarchy. A number of uh, interlocutors, a number of travellers also talk about the United States, by the way, and they, they, don't quite fully under, they don't fully understand what the presidency is, but they say in the United States everyone is free. It's all about liberty, freedom. And they say they're so free that they elect their monarch every four years. And they rotate. Everyone can be monarch for a period of four years. Whereas in, in Britain, the idea is, is that the concept of liberty, again, that sort of notion is very central. And it is this that attracts many of them. It's constitutionalism. It's the idea of liberty, it's the idea of the rule of law, it's, it's, it's really this, this notion uh, that there is freedom at the heart of the political system. And the way you achieve this uh, is through education. All this, to my mind, reflects a very strong uh, adherence to what we might call a Whig philosophy and a Whig philosophy of progress. And of course, one of the central things about them uh, the central aspects, and Fourouri is emblematic of this, of course, is that a lot of these thinkers, a lot of these intellectuals, were members of the of Masonic lodges. Now, of course, the reason they are members of Masonic lodges, or when we look at it from the retrospectively, they sort of say, well, this is obviously part of a great conspiracy theory, as uh, as we will, you know, we we uh, uh, we read all too often. But the fact is that in the 19th century and early 20th century, and certainly if you look at sort of radical uh, radical Whiggism and Masonic lodges in Europe in the 18th century, these were engines of social change, social and political change. These were the sort of the very iconoclastic, sort of, I wouldn't call them necessarily secret societies, but obviously they had, an, they had to be in partly secret because they were challenging established orders. What they had to do was to basically, um, uh, they, they, they acted as sort of a, 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 an international intellectual brotherhood. And a number of Iranians uh, joined Masonic lodges both in uh, France but also in Britain. Uh, and these were uh, a medium by which these ideas uh, could move. 
And a good number of these thinkers were, as I said, Masons. One of the key thinkers that a lot of, certainly, uh, 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 intellectuals today, and even in the Islamic Republic, will adhere to is Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. Afghani himself was a Mason. Uh, he was very iconoclastic. Um, some people like to view him, obviously, as a pan-Islamist. I tend not to see him too much as a pan-Islamist, but more as a rebel with a cause, since he seemed to rebel, rebel quite a bit in various places, he, the various areas he was. But he also was, as I say, a great champion, in a sense, of this concept of the rule of law. And I'm going to read you a passage which comes from a paper, a speech he delivered, which was then published in, uh, in a British journal. And it's quite telling, because often this... Uh, this, this uh, uh, Afghani's attitudes are meant to be seen as anti-British. Okay? They're meant to be seen as anti-British, anti-imperial. His agitation in British India, for instance. But in an article called The Reign of Terror in Persia, which was published in the Contemporary Review in 1892, he says the following. Let it be known that under the present Shah we have no law and of late I may add no government. A patriarchal government without a written code is tolerable, but neither law nor government, only cruel, rapacious, unscrupulous and sleepless tyranny, that is not tolerable, yet that is our lot. And this is the crucial passage which I think people, I find quite intriguing, but it's emblematic, as I said, of this sort of mood. And it tells us, you know, that relationship with Britain. And he says in this article the following, what made the Persian believe that England meant to help them? I pray you, did not your ministers a year or two ago urge upon the Shah a farman granting security of life and property to his subjects? Did not the Shah issue such a farman? And after considerable pressure and long debate and hesitation, frankly communicate to the powers? Did not Her Majesty, in this case he's referring to Queen Victoria, upon hearing this express to Malcolm Khan her profound satisfaction? And was not your minister at Tehran regarded as a party to the transaction? All Persians believed that a farman thus issued and communicated to the European powers gave the powers, England first and foremost, the diplomatic right to insist upon its due observance, or at least to demand the explanation for any gross violation of it. Well, what followed? I, Sheikh Jamal al-Din, soon after became the natural and respectful mouthpiece of the people's joyful aspirations. I am received with favour by His Majesty. My words are approved. The regeneration of Persia is at hand. Law is to be given. Life and property are to be safe. Our wives and daughters protected from outrage. Our breadwinners from cruel and ruinous exactions. All is going well. Suddenly I am seized, banished, imprisoned. My friends were imprisoned and tortured without explanation, without trial. The people's eyes were opened. They felt they could place no reliance on the Shah. But their eyes were then to the powers, to England, first and foremost, the second time he uses that phrase. Now, would the British minister at least certainly speak on little word at Tehran, if only to ask for some explanation of so gross a violation of the Blessed Faramon? But no, not a word. What basically Afghani is saying, as far as I can see, is why aren't the British intervening? I mean, that's what's quite interesting about his argument. Is he saying, why are you not living up? to the standards and ideals which you present. And that for me is quite different and indicates a quite different relationship or a quite different sort of understanding of that uh, engagement with, with Britain than people, uh, than people would traditionally understand. If you move forward and you go to someone like Hassan Taghizadeh, Taghizadeh himself in the aftermath of the Constitutional Revolution and the failure, particularly after the Anglo-Russian Convention in 1907, Perhaps I would argue one of the most disastrous policy choices, I think, of the British government at the time, and conducted by a liberal minister, of course, sadly. In his 1908 appeal, appeal to England, basically argues the same thing. Again, it's this notion that the British have let us down and you're not living up to your ideals. But the crucial distinction is this. It's not that they're anti-British in that sense. They're saying you should live up to the certain ideals that you, you hold. And in his case, in fact, his appeal to England is slightly contradictory. He doesn't sort of say to them, you know, we're not asking for you to intervene, but we are asking, asking you to stop the Russians from intervening, which, I mean, is a question of whether intervention or non-intervention matters here. What he says is basically that, you know, you leave us to, uh, to get on with it. We can develop this constitutionalism. Constitutionalism 
of which Britain is the mother of parliaments and the centre of constitutional government. Let us get on with what we need to do, but for goodness sake, stop the Russians killing us. Because if you don't stop them, you know we're in deep trouble. So again, it's a form of sort of asking the British to essentially live up uh, uh, to the ideals that they represent and to bring their policy in line with their politics. But it's very clear when you look at the writings of both Tarizadeh, Afghani is more, more interesting in that respect, but certainly as I quoted that passage there very deliberately, he does uh, indicate this, uh, uh, this leaning. Malcolm Khan, of course, is very obvious, partly because, of course, he uh, spends a good deal of time in London. But then if you look at the constitutionalists themselves in 1906, the constitution they develop, yes, is modelled on the Belgian constitution, but the Belgian constitution, as we know, is modelled, is a sort of a written form of what is considered to be the British constitution, which remains obviously unwritten uh, to this day. But this is something that, uh, uh, this is something that, reflects that sort of intellectual inheritance. But the other thing which I find very, very interesting is writings that come out of uh, nationalists in the post-constitutional period. And here, if you look at uh, the writings of Mahmoud Afshar or the, 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 the editors of Iran Shah, what's fascinating about it is the level, the depth of knowledge they have about Britain. And when they're looking at European countries, and they're arguing, you know, what is it about them? And remember, of course, this is an extremely turbulent period as far as nation building is concerned. In the post-First World War period, you see a number of countries, a number of dynastic states only dismembering and a number of new nations emerging. This caused a huge amount of panic, it has to be said, among Iranian nationalists who looked very, very ominously over at the Ottoman Empire and wondered what might happen to them. Um, but nonetheless, people like Afshar and others scoured this sort of European example to see what was it about the various European states that they could learn from? What could they learn, for instance, from the Austrian Empire? What could they learn from the Germans? They drew quite interesting comparisons between the failure of the Habsburg Empire, but the success, in a way, of the Germans to maintain some sort of unitary state, even though they were defeated in the war. But ultimately, what's fascinating is they always fixate on Britain as a model. And they say of all the countries in Europe, the one that is the most impressive, I mean, I have to say, they obviously haven't seen the recent referenda, but you know, the, uh, certainly in that period, uh, they're looking, they say, what is it about, that they're, that, about European countries? What is it about Britain that makes it most successful? And the thing they settled on, which I find really quite striking, is conservatism. Mahafiz Zikar. They say the thing with Britain is it's extremely conservative. But what sort of conservatism is it? It's a conservatism that goes hand in hand with progress. And if you read it, you cannot but think of Edmund Burke. That what they're really talking about is they're saying the success of Britain is it's not that they're unchanging. It's not that they are stuck in their ways. The success of the British state is they know how to manage change. And they talk about the various constituent parts of the kingdom. They talk about the Scots, the Welsh. They even, in one section, talk about the Cornish, which is quite progressive of them, I have to say. They talk about the different sort of linguistic elements of it. But they say, what is it about? What does this... And you can see the analogy they're drawing. Whereas the, the Turks, the modern Turkish Republic, borrows from the French. The Iranians have a different problem to deal with. They want to move from an imperial state to a national state. How can you move from an imperial state to a national state without foregoing, without suffering the loss of territory that the Ottomans did or the Russians did or others? What sort of multi-ethnic national state, if you will, can we find? And the one that they settle on is Britain. And the key element in there, of course, is the nature of their politics. And it goes back to what these early Orientists were saying, that if you get your politics right, other things flow. If you get your politics right, it's not simply that you can maintain the unitary state, albeit in quite a decentralised way. I mean, that's the interesting thing they also draw on. They say, if you look at it, the British state also, they have that, that, that capability of being both a unitary state, but one that is able to acknowledge various sort of disparate parts, distinctive parts. It's one that is both conservative and appreciates its past, but knows when it needs to move forward. Both Afshar says this very, very clearly in 
uh, various issues of Ayanda, but also in Iran Shah, you see this you see this being argued emphatically. And it's always the case that where they do a survey and they do a survey of all these countries and then they settle on they settle on uh, Britain as this model. And central to it, of course, is constitutionalism and the, and the rule of law. And this is something that the British for them excel in. This nuanced relationship, in a sense, is something which I just want to draw out here on a couple of case studies, because I'm sure a number of you will ask me about Mossad Dehr at some stage. Clearly, our understanding of, of that relationship between Britain and Iran is really driven by the coup of 1953 certainly in the popular historical record, and certainly in, in, in general historiography. This is just, a, again, a more contemporary picture because, of course, they use the... I decided to insert this one in because they obviously use Mossad Dehr and they try and portray Zarif, of course, as, a, as, as, as someone who has succeeded where Mossad Dehr failed, in some sense, to, to, to basically um, um, deal with a political and in, industrial problem. It's also handy because, you know, we're dealing oil on one side and nuclear on the other side, and my case studies are basically oil in the nuclear industry, but not in the nuclear industry that you think. I'm not going to go into huge detail about the, the oil nationalisation crisis, per se, because I'm sure all of you are more than familiar with, obviously, the details, and obviously this is another case where Iranian intellectuals, I think, would quite rightly say that the British did not fulfil the promise of their, of their politics, but instead got involved in, in specific policy issues. Uh, and certainly, if you were to look at Mossad Dehr as emblematic of a sort of a constitutional era politician, he's someone that you would, one would think would have more in common, certainly, with the, um, uh, with the British sort of Whig tradition. And, and if you looked at the details of the dispute, of course, you would have seen many people in Britain who disagreed with the way in which their government worked. But what's interesting for me is not so much that level of um, the, 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 the sort of the historiographical animosity, obviously, that develops from this particular incident, but the fact that 25 years after the nationalisation of the, 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 the coup of 1953, and this sort of, the, this momentous event, in a sense, in terms of, uh, narratives of Anglo-Iranian relations, you get a new development, never really realised, but one that was fascinating nonetheless. And it's a case study I've worked on, uh, which most people tend to avoid uh, or haven't really seen, and that is this organisation, from the AIOC to the NCBI. And I bet nobody's ever heard of the NCBI, but the NCBI is the nuclear company of Britain and Iran, which is an interesting organisation that was going to be formed in 1977. Now, what was the nuclear company of Britain and Iran? Well, what I found fascinating about this is that less than 25 years, that has to be said, after the coup, you had a situation where the Iranians were looking to develop their nuclear industry uh, with a foreign power, and they had the choice, obviously, of the Americans and the Soviets and the Germans and the French and the British. The British nuclear industry was not as developed as many of the other nuclear industries, but nonetheless it was a, a player. In 1977, the Iranians themselves approached the British, discreetly obviously, but nonetheless approached the British, and said, you know, we want to develop our nuclear industry. You won't see this in any of the books, because as I said, it never actually happened for obvious reasons, but the fact is it's, it is quite interesting, there's plenty of documentation on it. In fact, Akbar Etemad makes a discreet offer to William Marshall in a meeting in Tehran. He says, we want to develop our nuclear industry, and we want to make it an industry, by the way. We don't want just to buy things off people. We want to actually develop an industry. And we're looking for a partner to work with. And we've looked at the various countries. We think the Americans are a bit difficult. The Soviets, well, we'll forget that because they're not very really safe. Uh, the Germans will only offer us turnkey projects. The French, well, they charge too much. And they come to the conclusion, and it shocks the British, I have to say, that they want to go and work with the British, partly because the state of the British industry at the time is such that, for Etemad and the others, they see a degree of parity there. They said, you know, you're not going to bully us. The Americans might bully us. I mean, it's worth actually recounting Etemad's trip to the Soviet Union to look at Soviet reactors. That didn't go down very well. But because of a level of political parity, they decide to sort of go in industrial parity, I should say. They go, they go for the British. And there's a list of things that they, they, they put down on the sheet. The British go back to, Marshall goes back to London. And he says, you know, we've just been made this spectacular offer. They want to do, form a joint company, a nuclear company of Britain and Iran. 
It's going to involve, believe it or not, the construction of 20 nuclear reactors in Iran, uh, two a year from 1984. Um, and the Iranians will pay us something like $20 billion for this and invest in industry in Britain. It would have put Al-Yamama in the shade, let's be honest about it, if it had happened, but it didn't. But it was a, an extraordinary project. But among the list of things that came out is this thing, a criteria that comes out, is this idea that um, among the great qualities that the British have is that they are more trustworthy than anyone else, which I hope you will find rather jolly, but there you are. Uh, this idea that you can do business with them. And I have to say, I mean, one of, the more, uh, one of the more interesting things about it is the British themselves are a little bit shocked by this comment. You know, they sort of wonder, why, why do they think that? But what's interesting about that is that it reflects the fact that for many uh, Iranians, certainly of a, of a particular sort of uh, um, uh, uh, industrial and political elite, that relationship with Britain, although in some ways unfulfilled and really quite problematic, still in some ways the British represented people they could do business with in a way that they couldn't necessarily with either the superpowers or indeed uh, with France and Germany. So this for me just reflects the fact that even those narratives of 1953, as emphatic as they, as they have become in our, uh, in, our, uh, in our understanding of the relationship, I think, we have to, I think we have to understand that the relationship has always been a lot more nuanced than that and in some ways a lot more positive than that. I know it's probably a very unpopular thing to say, I have to, I have to be honest with you, but the fact is when you look at the detail of the historical detail of that relationship um, and the appropriation of ideas in particular, um, what, you see is something, uh, what you see is something quite different. The reason ultimately it didn't work, by the way, is because the British, interestingly enough, uh, when they made their assessments as to the stability of the regime, decided that they felt they couldn't get involved in a contract that would be take them up to 25 years uh, with a regime they weren't sure was going to be entirely stable. I wouldn't want to say that they predicted anything else before people get the wrong idea, but the fact is it's quite interesting that they thought this was too much of a strategic relationship. But at the same time, it has to be said from the Iranian perspective, they felt that the British could not deliver on various aspects of the, uh, of, 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 of the agreement. So might we face, and you, this is a dreadful slide, unfortunately, because it didn't come across very well, but it's sort of dated to the 18th century. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely slide of you know, Britain and Persia, Britannia and Persia. Britannia and Persia, I think, dated about 1747, um, before Britain really becomes uh, that political player. Uh, I suppose the short answer to that, a new relationship, is no. Uh, I don't think there will be. Not in the immediate future. But I do think that our understanding of the relationship between Britain and Iran does warrant uh, more investigation and more study. Um, that narrative that we've understood now is one that I think is, is riven with different uh, ideological issues and one that simply doesn't stand uh, the test of, uh, of, of, of any sort of academic scrutiny when you compare it with the Russian relationship. It's also clear to me that the more you read the sources from the 19th and early 20th century, you'll find that many of the ideas uh, about the nature of, of, of political organization uh, state building, nation building, and others were drawn not from a French model, certainly not from a Russian model, uh, but actually from what we might term a sort of a, an Atlanticist model. They didn't go really for an American model because they weren't prepared to give up their monarchy. But they did go, in a sense, for what we might term a Republican model. And by Republican model, that was one in which the rule of law dominated. And the rule of law guaranteed freedoms. And they found that very attractive. And it's not by any, you know, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence at all, or it shouldn't be surprising at all, that visitors that went to Britain, lesser case to France, but certainly to Britain, what impressed them were aspects of political and social organisation. And that's what they account for in their, in their travelogues and diaries and others. What impresses them is this idea of liberty, the idea of liberty and the idea that some form of political organization uh, of that nature allows people to fulfill their potential. They never really achieve it, obviously, in Iran, but it's something that they, that they absorb. 
And while I have to say, and it is work in progress, of course, because I haven't gone through every material yet, it's difficult often to see direct intellectual inheritance. For my, to my mind, there is enough there. There is enough in the literature to see where they borrowed these ideas from, particularly this concept of a sort of a conservatism that can change, the attractiveness of this sort of Burkean model, that you have to know what to conserve in order to know what to change. And, of course, Britain for them represented that state, that successful state, uh, that the state that could succeed without revolution, although I have to say that's a slightly in, uh, uh, optimistic reading of the British state, but nonetheless, uh, one that in their minds, you know, required the least amount of sort of political turmoil. And it's one, of course, that the British themselves endorsed, supported and pushed. And what's fascinating also for me is that certainly in the earlier uh, uh, accounts, you get a lot of British uh, uh, intellectuals who encourage who encourage the Iranians um, uh, uh, to do this, to say that you can do it through education. And this is the chap who we ought to really thank, because the person who really did do this a huge amount, I don't know if you can see, that's Edward Brown Street. Just to remind ourselves that Edward Brown still retains a street name in Tehran. And why is that? Because Edward Brown, as the sort of the leading Persianist, or the founder really of Persian studies in Great Britain, um, is someone who was seen as pivotal in encouraging this notion that the Persians could, in a sense, uh, empower and emancipate themselves. Uh, he was part of that uh, quite distinct narrative, and the Iranians have always thanked him for it. Um, obviously, around the corner, there's also Bobby Sand Street, but we won't go into that at the moment. I will leave it there. Uh, I hopefully, I've given you some food for thought, um, and uh, I'll let John chair the questions, hopefully, if that would be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>